Indeed, welcome to Birmingham, the home of Thomas Shelby, Brummy Bull, and the birthplace of Richard Hammond. I'm from Birmingham. Today we're going to cycle from here to Shrewsbury along Route 5 and Route 81 of the National Cycle Network. We're starting our journey here at Brindley Place in Birmingham city centre, a former industrial area on the edge of the Birmingham Mainline Canal. It was rejuvenated in the 1990s with the shops and offices that we see today. It's named after James Brindley, the engineer of the first canal that linked Birmingham to Wolverhampton, which is the next city that we're aiming for. From here we're going to use Route 5 of the National Cycle Network to make our way to Smethwick. Here we'll switch to Route 81 and continue our journey through the Black Country all the way to Wolverhampton city centre. We'll then head from Wolverhampton towards Telford and finally from Telford to Shrewsbury, Shrewsbury. all using as many traffic free routes as we can. We start our journey by heading down the side of the National Sea Life Centre. This sits to the side of the Birmingham Main Line Canal, the towpath of which we'll be following as we make our way out of Birmingham on Route 5. Route 5 is on the opposite side of the canal, so we need to make our way over and start to head northwest along our route. As you can imagine, not being far from the city centre, this section of towpath can get quite busy, so do be careful as you go down here, and a bell is a must. There's a couple of bridges we need to navigate ourselves under, so do be careful because it does narrow the towpath a little bit. And there is no guardrail to stop you going in the canal. After passing under that second bridge, the canal takes on a different character from what it was in the city centre. You can see there seems to be a bit more space here, and although you can tell you're still in an urban area, you don't feel as closed in as you did at the start of the ride. After passing under the Birmingham Inner Ring Road, you'll notice that the canal becomes absolutely arrow straight. And if we look at a map of this section of canal, we can see a couple of curious canal loops coming off this very straight section of canal. The original canal, designed by James Brindley, followed the lay of the land as much as possible, so meandered its way out of Birmingham, through the Black Country and to Wolverhampton, with quite a few locks along the way and only a towpath on one side. By 1824, it was apparent that something better was needed. Thomas Telford was appointed chief engineer to improve the canal between Birmingham and Wolverhampton. He used huge embankments, large cuttings and tunnels to create a much straighter route to Wolverhampton, cutting over seven miles off the route, also significantly widening the canal and adding a towpath to both sides most of the way. This canal was the motorway of the 1800s and it cut through the route of the old canal, creating these curious loops off the main line. We can see here when one of these loops crosses the main line of the canal. A section there in front of us going off. And behind us, the new section of main line canal heading towards Birmingham city centre. There with the skyline in the distance. We actually have a train line up against the canal here. And off under the train line goes the other old section of canal heading away from the new main line. It's because of this, the way that this new main line was built, that you can expect to cross quite a few junctions on the canal. So there's a lot of these little bridges to traverse as we make our way up Route 5. Because of these many canal loops and the extensive canal network in Birmingham, you may have heard people refer to Birmingham as the Venice of the North. People are from Birmingham are always saying it's the Venice of the North. When we reach Smethwick, it looks as if the canal splits into two with a left and right fork. In fact, the right fork is the original route of the James Brindley Canal which goes up and over the Smethwick summit using a number of locks. The route on the left is Thomas Telford's new route, which uses a large cutting to make its way through the Smethwick summit, getting rid of the need for any locks and thus speeding up traffic flow through this section. We cross the old canal here on a bridge that was put in by Thomas Telford as part of the improvements to the canal here. It was cast just up the road in Tipton at Horsley Ironworks and is grade two listed. As we head into the cutting that Thomas Telford created, we come across more of his handiwork crossing over the top. This is the engine arm aqueduct, built by Thomas Telford out of cast iron to carry yet another canal over the top of this cutting. It's one of many iron aqueducts that Telford created, including the Pont Cusulloth aqueduct, which we recently crossed in my Route 84 video. 
Not far from the engine arm aqueduct, we begin to approach the Galton Tunnel. This is the first of two tunnels that we pass through on our way to Wolverhampton. This first one is much shorter than the second, and as you may have guessed by the use of concrete in its construction, it's also a rather modern addition to the canal. It was put in in the 1970s, when the cutting was infilled to accommodate a much wider road over the top of the canal than that had previously been there. And although Thomas Telford was long gone at this point, the road over the top was named after him, Telford Way, just if you needed any more reminding that he was instrumental in this canal, and seemingly anything that crossed over it. As we emerge out of the tunnel, we're greeted with the view of two bridges. The first being the Galton Bridge, a road bridge that Thomas Telford built out of cast iron. It was completed in 1829, and is now a Grade 1 listed structure. The second bridge is a railway viaduct that was put in a little later in 1860. It's at this point that we leave Route 5. Marked by a little blue sticker on the railings and a millennial milepost, Route 5 takes a right turn and heads up the embankment towards Walsall. But we're going to carry on along the route of the canal towards Wolverhampton along what is now Route 81 of the National Cycle Network. As we begin to hear the M5 in the distance, we come to a closure of the towpath due to an unsafe wall. Now this does seem to be a temporary measure and there is quite a clear diversion in place here but it does mean we have to leave the cut for the first time in this journey. So we head up the ramp up to the road above, where we take a right turn and head along the road. As we go under the M5 motorway we take a left and then follow the old route of the Birmingham Canal, which carries on under the M5 motorway at this point. And then eventually we take another left and head back down to the new Birmingham Mainline Canal, which we were previously on. It's not an ideal route to take, as you can see here we've got some wooden hills to negotiate as we go back down to the canal but hopefully this is a temporary measure and soon we'll be back to just cycling along the towpath. We now need to cross again under the old route of the canal and then onwards and underneath the M5 motorway. I've crossed over the top of this motorway many times on my way to the southwest, but I've never had this view from below. It's actually quite an impressive structure here as it crosses the Birmingham Mainline Canal. As you'll know if you've driven this section of motorway, from the M6 junction to junction 3 of the M5 it's entirely elevated as it makes its way through the Sandwell Valley. But from just driving down the motorway you'd have no idea of the engineering that went into this section when it was built between 1967 and 1970. As we make our way under the bridge we come into what is known as the Black Country, or at least I've always seen the M5 as the boundary between Birmingham and the Black Country. Let me know if you think different. But it's generally accepted that the Black Country incorporates Walsall, West Brom, Wolverhampton, Sandwell and Dudley and all the way down to Stourbridge. Although I have heard it said that no two Yam Yams will agree on where the Black Country starts and ends. The area was heavily industrialised in the early 1800s with coal mines, steelworks, iron foundries and brickworks. And the black soot that was produced by these industries covered the area and this is said to be the origin of the name Black Country as everything was covered in black soot. It was one of those black country iron foundries that cast this bridge here that I'm just going underneath that I should have actually gone over the top of to cross the canal to carry on Route 81. I quickly realised that I was on the wrong route as I knew I had to follow the main line of the canal and looking back at my GoPro footage there was a couple of signs that I missed although these are quite small signs and that's my excuse and I'm sticking to it. I quickly turned around and made way over the bridge and headed down the other side of the mainline canal and carried on my journey on Route 81. One of the things that struck me about this route is that it is a green corridor in what is still today a very industrial area. The canal was built to service the heavy industries in the area, bringing in raw materials and taking out finished product. It would have been a hive of activity in the early 1800s, and although today you can still hear and see the factories up against the canal, it's much quieter and provides, in my opinion, a much better route from Birmingham to Wolverhampton than either the Birmingham New Road or the M6, although I must say the train isn't a bad option to go between the two. You may also know that there's a tram service that runs between Birmingham and Wolverhampton, the Midland Metro, and here at Dudleyport Station we cross over an extension that's currently being built to this metro service. It will run from Wensbury down to Briley Hill where it will terminate at the Merry Hill Shopping Centre. It's using the old South Staffordshire Railway line, this was closed to passengers in 1968, but was used by freight trains till as late as 1993. So fortunately the route has been kept clear and it can be repurposed as this tramway. 
As we carry on towards Bilston, along this incredibly straight section of canal, we come to a bridge, which is fairly inconspicuous, but I noticed the name on this bridge was Watery Lane, and that rung a bell. In the BBC One series, Watery Lane was the home of the Shelby family, and it was indeed a real street in Birmingham. But it was actually in the small heath area of Birmingham, not here in the black country. So it isn't the same lane, but it did remind me of the show, especially as the Peaky Blinders were regular users of the canal network around Birmingham. And staying on the Peaky Blinders theme, a little bit further up the canal, after we've crossed over and gone past the only set of locks on the stretch between Birmingham and Wolverhampton, we come to a junction called Factory Road Junction. This is where the Dudley Canal meets the Birmingham Mainline Canal. And if you were to follow the Dudley Canal, you'd make your way through Dudley, down to Briley Hill and to Stourbridge. But also you'd pass, not far from here, the Black Country Living Museum, where a lot of scenes from Peaky Blinders were filmed, due to it authentically recreating how life was here back in the early 1900s. At this point I'd be missing a trick if I didn't tell you to subscribe. I order the Peaky Blinders. And if you're enjoying the video, there's a link in the description to buy me a beer. Moving on from the factory road junction, the canal becomes considerably quieter and also becomes a little bit twistier as we make our way towards Coesley. And it's at Coesley that we come across probably the biggest engineering feat on the canal between Wolverhampton and Birmingham, the Coesley Tunnel. The Coesley Tunnel is 329 metres long and bows its way under Coesley Town Centre. The official Route 81 avoids going through this tunnel by leaving the canal and going through Coesley. But this is definitely something I wanted to explore. So on my way into Birmingham I cycled through the tunnel going south and on the way back I cycled the official route of 81 so I could compare it to going through the tunnel and see which one would be best. The tunnel certainly feels a little daunting as you enter it with water streaming down onto the opposite towpath and the towpath this side is pretty uneven however at least it is dry. There's no lighting in the tunnel but I must say when I first entered I thought that wouldn't be a problem as I could see the other end and it seemed quite light as I went in. It wasn't long though before the tunnel became very very dark towards the centre. This is something I'd definitely recommend using a light for, especially if you're going to do this when it's not full daylight outside. Eventually as I started to reach the other side of the tunnel, the light began to stream in from the outside. And I did safely make my way through the tunnel without ending up in the canal. So that's what you can expect if you follow the canal and go through the Coesley Tunnel. But let's take a look at the official route of 81 here. Heading north before you get to the tunnel, you're directed right at this fork. At the top of the slope, you're directed right and then left down some residential streets. There is a traffic free section as you make your way through Coesley and down the side of some playing fields, but it did require me to carry my bike over the top of a kissing gate. Then there's a small section of busy road before another residential street and making your way back down onto the mainline canal. For me personally, I'd always use the tunnel. The signage on the route around the tunnel is not the best and I did have to check my phone a couple of times to make sure I was on the right route. But now you've seen both options, that's a decision you can make yourself. We continue our way towards Bilston and then on to Wolverhampton city centre. The canal continues to follow a twistier path than it did previously. I wasn't actually 100% sure that Route 81 would get us all the way to Wolverhampton city centre. On the Sustrans map, you can see there's a large gap in Route 81 between Bilston and the city centre, and I wasn't sure that there would be a path here for me to follow. But as the canal snaked its way closer to Wolverhampton centre, the towpath continued to be there. There was no break in the route. The canal makes its way past older industrial areas and new housing estates, the skyline of the city centre comes into view as we head towards the train station. From here we head under Wensfield Road and towards Wolverhampton city centre and the end of this first leg of 14 miles between Birmingham and Wolverhampton. From here we're going to carry on along the canal, the last couple of miles before it meets the Staffordshire and Worcestershire Canal. We're then going to use a couple more canal towpaths before using some quiet lanes to make our way to the outskirts of Telford. From here to Telford, it's just under 20 miles. And because there is a bit more road riding in this section, albeit quiet lanes, I've done a magical bike change to my road bike. But as you can see by the bumpiness of this footage, especially as we make our way around this lock gate, 
This path is not exactly the perfect territory for a road bike and I did begin to wonder whether I'd made the right choice, especially as the path narrowed as it headed under this first bridge. Road bikes are not the most manoeuvrable things in the world and I did think I'd much rather have been on my mountain bike at this point. But after passing under the bridge and then through this gate which was easy enough on my narrow handlebar road bike, not so easy on a fully loaded touring bike or with a child trailer, the path opened up and became much wider and much smoother, perfectly acceptable for riding a road bike on. We begin to descend what seems to be an endless series of locks, some of them with good surfaces like that one, and some of them that become quite narrow and quite bumpy as they go under bridges after the lock. There's no escaping you in an urban area here, as the canal makes its way under an awful lot of road bridges, and under a few rail bridges as well before eventually you make your way to the Stafford Road Bridge. Again, a narrow, bumpy path down under the bridge. But as we make our way to the other side, the canal seems to open up a little bit and you feel like there's a bit more breathing space. After descending yet another lock, we get a fantastic view of the Oxley Viaduct. This was built between 1847 and 1849 by Robert Stevenson and William Baker and it formed part of the line between Birmingham and Shrewsbury. This impressive looking viaduct is Grade 2 listed and it consists of 12 arches with the arch that crosses the canal on the skew compared to the other ones apparently making this viaduct fairly unique. As we continue our journey along this rather pleasant section of canal there's yet more locks to descend as we make our way to the junction with the Staffordshire and Worcestershire Canal. There's actually 21 locks on this section of canal. They lower the canal a total of 37 metres over 2 miles and were part of the original canal built by James Brindley in 1772. The final lock is just before the junction with the Staffordshire and Worcestershire Canal where we promptly cross over that canal and take a right turn to continue our journey. The cycle path along the side of the canal here is generally pretty good although there was one section that again made me question my choice of bike. As I bumped over these drainage ditches and rode through the mud, I did think, should I have bought my mountain bike? But the path is generally quite good, and it's not far up here until we reach the junction of the Staffordshire and Worcestershire Canal and the Shropshire Union Canal. We head over the Shropshire Union Canal and then take a left to follow its course. This canal was quite a latecomer in terms of canals, not being finished until 1835. It was built by the Shropshire Union Canal and Railways Company, hence the name Shropshire Union Canal. It was the last major civil engineering project undertaken by Thomas Telford, so it seems quite appropriate that we're using it to make our way towards the town named in his honour. The service of the towpath here is really pretty good, until you come to the stretch between the last two bridges. Here it turns into a muddy track, and as I was on my road bike I decided just to skip this and take a detour along the roads. It's a shame the towpath is not in a better condition because this could make a great link between Route 81 in Wolverhampton and Route 55 at Nosal. It would also mean we could get to Telford with very little road riding, albeit a slightly longer route. But as it is, from here on in we're pretty much on the roads all the way to Telford. And the fact that the blue line on the Sustrans map was dotted gave me the impression that this may be an unloved part of the network more of a recommended route than an official part of the network. But I was pleasantly surprised to find that this part of the route through Billbrook and Codsall was extremely well signposted, with rather new looking blue signs at every turn, and I mean literally every turn as we made our way through this residential area. After making another right turn, clearly marked by this signpost, we make our way onto Hushpins Lane and out of this urban area, and onto the type of lanes I'm more used to riding on my road bike. This quiet rural lane will take us most of the way to our next destination on Route 81, or Brighton. As we continue down this road it looked like the good signage was going to carry on, but unfortunately as we take a right turn and then a left turn onto Harriet Hayes Road just before it joins the A41, the signs unfortunately disappeared. I did spot a small sticker directing us right just before I reached the A41 but it certainly wasn't up to the standard that we'd seen in Billbrook and Codsall. This stretch along the A41 is only a short stretch fortunately, because this is an extremely busy road and an extremely fast road, 
so do take a lot of care if you do plan on coming down here. The route heads into Albrighton under the Birmingham to Shrewsbury Railway, past Albrighton train station and down towards the High Street where we take a right and head through the centre of the town. As we head out of Albrighton, the signs again improve and we're directed left here, down the side of the A41 on this cycleway. Which although not the best in the world, is still much better than cycling on the A41. This cycleway takes us to RAF Cosford. Opened in 1938 as an aircraft maintenance, storage and technical training area. It's named after Cosford Grange House at the southwest of the airfield. It was originally a grass runway here, but during World War II it was upgraded to tarmac. During the war it continued to be used for aircraft maintenance, as well as a base to deliver Spitfire aircraft from to the various places they were needed around the country. We eventually pass under again the Birmingham to Shrewsbury Railway and are greeted with the sight of the runway. As well as the many hangars here, you may also get a sight of the Midlands Air Ambulance, which is based here. A little further down the road is the RAF Cosford Museum. I'd recommend not flying past here, because on the grass outside is a Hawker Hunter. This type of fighter jet served in the RAF from 1956 to 1963, and was used for training purposes right up until the 1980s. The RAF Cosford Museum is a great day out, and it is free entry. The only thing that you're asked to pay for is parking. So there's some incentive to get on your bike. Moving on from the museum, we again cross the Birmingham to Shrewsbury Railway. This time over the top, giving an opportunity for some train spotting. The route continues down Neatchley Lane as it heads towards Shifnal. There are a couple of short sharp climbs on this section. Nothing substantial by any means, but I think because the route had been so flat up to this point, I did notice them. We then join Stanton Road a much busier road than Neachley Lane, but I was happy to see the signpost there directing us left onto this. This is a fast section of B Road that will take us into Shifnal, fortunately only about a mile away from here. There's nothing too much exciting to see in Shifnal, not that it's a bad place, but we're directed away from the centre around residential streets. We leave Shifnal using Horton Lane, which after a short climb widens and flattens out as it makes its way to Junction 4 of the M54. It's worth noting that the route here recently changed and there is a signpost still directing us right here along the old route which has changed due to a new housing development on the edge of Telford. We need to carry on straight between the M54 and the services. From the end of this road we join a traffic free section which takes us around the M54 island and upwards into the area known as Priorsley where we officially enter Telford. Welcome to Telford New Town. Continuing up Castle Farm Way named after the farm that previously occupied this area we pass by some housing estates under construction, or if you're watching this in a couple of years time, we pass by some new houses. We take a very well signposted left turn and head up a cycle path which takes us through the centre of Priorsley. This cycle path, with the exception of a small piece of quiet road that we need to use, takes us to where Route 81 crosses the A5, and at this point here, we also cross over with Route 55. I've done a video on Route 55 from Colport to Stafford. I'll leave a link in the description to that if you want to have a look. From here, Route 81 heads through the area of St George's on the road. To avoid having to cycle on the road, I'm going to head down Route 55. I'm then going to follow this cycle path through Rockadyne Wood to meet up again with Route 81 in Trench. After cycling the short bit of Route 55 downhill, we can follow Rockadyne Wood Way until we get to this small turn off, which has signs directing us back to Route 81. It is a little bit of road riding, but it's a very quiet residential street. We then cross over the A442 and back onto Route 81. After following the twists and turns of Route 81, all well signposted, we make our way to Trench Lock Interchange. Unsurprisingly, this is named Trench Lock due to the fact there used to be a canal lock here. This was part of the Shrewsbury Canal, which ran from Shrewsbury to Coalport. And on this last leg of our journey towards Shrewsbury, we are going to crisscross the canal a couple of times. And we're also going to follow the old route of it as we get to Shrewsbury. I'm going to leave Route 81 again here, it goes off there to the left. But I'm going to continue along the A442 
as it has cycle paths leading along the edge of it, all the way to the edge of Telford. Route 81 does follow cycle paths through the areas of Ligomery and into Wellington. But then as you pass around Wellington, there's a fair bit of road riding on quite busy roads, so I think this is a better route to stay on traffic free routes as much as possible. A little later on as well, we also get to ride down an old railway line, which if you've watched the channel before, you'll know is something that I love. As we follow the A442 through the Hadley Park area of Telford, there's a left turn that I'm going to take a detour down to have a look at the old route of the Shrewsbury Canal. The part to the south side of the A442 actually still has some water in, and a little bit further down this path, there's a rather interesting lock that we can take a look at. So this is where we've just come from, down the side of this canal bed. As you can see, there's still water in the bottom of it. I mean, you couldn't get a canal boat down there, but definitely can tell it used to be a canal. And if we turn around, you can see this old lock gate. This is the Hadley Park lock, one of 11 locks on the 17 mile length of the Shrewsbury Canal from Trench to Shrewsbury. Right, time to finish with this lock looking detour and carry on along the A442 on these cycle paths which take us to the area of Ackley and then across another roundabout you will cross a few roundabouts here we are in Telford uh, to the area of Shawbirch. In Shawbirch the cycle path does end unfortunately so we need to cycle a few hundred metres along this road before we're able to turn left onto a cycle path which follows the route of an old railway. And although this is not part of the National Cycle Network, there are some blue signs here directing us back to Route 81, which this will link up with on the edge of Wellington. This disused line is the old Wellington to Market Drayton Railway, which was opened in 1862. It ran from Wellington to Market Drayton, obviously, and then had connecting lines towards Nantwich and Crewe, and also over to Stoke. It was never a particularly busy line, with it running through some rather rural areas and passenger traffic ceased in 1963, with freight traffic ending in 1967. After a mile or so, the route brings us onto Route 81 again, at Rockadyne Road, just on the edge of Wellington, and also the edge of Telford. From here we're going to be following Route 81 to our final destination of the Crowy Park in the centre of Shrewsbury. The route meanders through quiet lanes as it makes its way to the edge of Shrewsbury, and then follows a cycle path along the side of the Shrewsbury Canal, before making its way into the centre of Shrewsbury. Here we pass under the Birmingham to Shrewsbury Railway. This would have joined up with the disused line that we've just left. When we get to the village of Rockwardine, we need to take a right turn to continue through the village and on Route 81. This is marked with one of the National Cycle Network blue signs, but I did find when we left the village a couple of the turnings weren't marked. That goes the same for this whole route between Telford and Shrewsbury. Some of it is well signposted and some of it is not so well posted. So I would make sure you either know where you're going or you have the route downloaded to your phone or cycle computer. I'm going to put a link to this ride in the description of the video if you want to follow it. The village of Rockwardine sits on top of a small hill. So when leaving the village I did get some great views of the Shropshire countryside with Hormond Hill directly in front of us and even further in the distance, Middletown Hill, which marks the border between England and Wales. After passing through the village of Charlton, and once again under the Birmingham to Shrewsbury Railway, we come through the village of Walcott, and the spot where Route 81 crosses the River Turn. There's a lot going on at this river crossing. Just before the bridge, the River Road joins the River Turn, and they make their final journey down to the River Severn not too far away. There's a modern sluice just slightly upstream. This was built in the 60s to keep the river level high for the All Scott Sugar Beet Factory just upstream from here. It was also the site of a corn mill that actually operated all the way back from 1100 AD until 1962. After crossing the river, a little further down we take a left turn and make our way towards the village of Withington, carrying on along these lovely quiet lanes. In the village of Withington, we cross over the route of the old Shrewsbury Canal again. Here you can see there's a bridge, but absolutely no sign of the canal in the fields and the garden that it used to run through. 
Canal closed in stages, but was fully abandoned by 1944. In 1963, the canal network was transferred to British waterways, and much of the Shrewsbury Canal was sold off and destroyed. From here, it's another couple of miles to the village of Upton Magna. And along the way, the route is again well signposted, with the little blue signs being there, as long as you look out for them. It's also worth looking out along this section for the Reekin Hill, which towers to the southeast, just outside Wellington. Legend has it that this hill was created by a giant who had a spade full of dirt who was looking to dam the River Severn just outside Shrewsbury in order to flood the town. Fortunately, after becoming lost and tired, he dumped the dirt just outside Wellington, creating the 1335 foot Reekin Hill. We next pass through the village of Upton Magna, with this lovely old fashioned sign in the middle, telling us that we have 5 miles to go along Route 81 towards Shrewsbury, and also we're crossing over Route 45 of the National Cycle Network here. As we head towards Uffington, we do have a little bit of a gradient as we make our way around the edge of Hormond Hill. Hormond Hill is run by the Forestry Commission and does have some great walking routes for children. At this point you also get a great view of the South Shropshire Hills in the distance. Just before we get to Uffington, we pass over the Shrewsbury Canal again, although to be honest, you wouldn't know unless you looked from the air. We then have this road, which is 30 mile an hour, that we have to follow for a short distance before we'll turn off to the left and join the route of the old Shrewsbury Canal. We'll follow this for a short while as we make our way towards Shrewsbury Centre. The canal path does start out as tarmac, but there are some gravel sections as it makes its way towards Shrewsbury. Although to be honest, even on my road bike, the surface was absolutely fine, I had no problem traversing it. There is a little more road riding as we make our way through a residential street, and then onto the beautiful tree-lined Sydney Avenue, as we make our way to Shrewsbury Weir. The Weir was built in 1909, simply to keep the water level high enough around Shrewsbury, so boats could use it all year round. From here we're going to be following the River Severn towards Crowy Park. We go under the railway bridge which essentially has Shrewsbury Station above it, as you can see it's quite large, and then also cross under the English Bridge before making our way into Crowy Park and the final bit of our journey to Shrewsbury. The park can be quite busy, especially at weekends, so make sure you've got a bell and do look out for people that are walking through. And also look out for the statue of Hercules, which could be found on your left, as you make your way towards our final destination, the Port Hill Suspension Bridge. This carries Route 81 over the River Severn, as it makes its way west out of Shrewsbury towards Wales. The bridge was opened in 1923, and replaced a ferry service that used to operate here. It links the Port Hill area of Shrewsbury to the Crowy Park, this wonderful green space in the centre of Shrewsbury. And that's it, we've made it 53 miles from the centre of Birmingham, to the centre of Shrewsbury. Shrewsbury. About half the route has been on traffic free cycle paths, with the other parts mostly being on very quiet single track lanes. Although there have been some residential areas and the occasional slightly busy road that we have had to navigate. But I think that's pretty good going, especially as we've come through some very busy urban areas and out of the centre of an extremely large city. If you've enjoyed the video, please do give it a like and a subscription to the channel really does keep the wheels rolling. It's completely free and helps me out massively. You can also buy me a beer via the link in the description. Thank you very much for watching and happy cycling.